In The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams said, space is big, really, really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemists, but that's peanuts compared to space. Now all we need to do is to substitute the word healthcare for space, and we begin to approach the subject with the right mindset. Especially if we consider that Douglas Adams also said, quote, all you really need to know for the moment is that the universe is a lot more complicated than you might think, even if you start from a position of thinking it's pretty damn complicated in the first place. So with that advice, and from the perspective of a seasoned traveler, I propose to lead you on a whirlwind tour across the global health landscape. We'll explore the current state of healthcare systems, point out some notable features, acknowledge the challenges we face, and finally, I'll hand my telescope to give you a glimpse, albeit a perfect one, of what lies on the horizon. And then when we're finished, we can discuss how liberalism, human action, and non-human action could impact and help shape the course of our future journey. Will we end up charting a path guided by the principles of innovation? Or will we take one laid out according to the precautionary principle? Or instead, will we decide to head into a future in a sort of generative AI-powered driverless car that we let chart the course for us? Now, before setting out on that healthcare landscape, I'll give a little bit more background about myself to give context for the conversation. I am not an economist. I'm not a physician or an insurer or even a policymaker. So therefore, I will not presume to speak authoritatively on any of those particular lenses. Instead, my approach is shaped by my journey through the healthcare ecosystem, and I've held a variety of roles in there. Um, of course, like everyone, I'm a healthcare consumer, both for myself and for my family. Uh, and as Audrey already said, I spent a number of years um, in a, working for a nonprofit hospital in France, which gave me an insight into how healthcare institutions operate. And as a consultant, I've specialized in strategy and communication, collaborating with patient groups, clinical research organizations, and pharmaceutical companies. And I've spoken on all kinds of things um, like patient physician communication and healthcare in the post COVID era. And I've even worked a while in the field of agricultural innovation, which is not entirely unrelated to healthcare. Um, and the final little piece of information is I'm proud to be a part of a team at a group called Trivariance, which is an investment management group in Milan, Italy, uh, which is focused on healthcare infrastructure, including, but not just, the silver economy. So now that we've established those bona fides, uh, let's do a short historical detour before I hold up our little tour umbrella and we can begin. So a decade ago, when I would speak about healthcare, my focus was much more on exciting gee whiz possibilities. Things like wearable devices, those nifty gadgets that can track uh, and record healthcare data, similar to the Apple Watch that I forgot to put on uh, this afternoon. And also about the potential for personal medicine, and personalized medicine, where treatments are adapted to an individual's genetic makeup. I advocated for reducing over-reliance on healthcare insurance for routine health maintenance and minor procedures and emphasizing the importance of involving more nurses and physician's assistants, pointing out the, direct, uh, the advantages of direct provider care, which is an approach that manages an individual like a system. In short, a number of discrete and separate things that could enhance choice foster innovation, improve outcomes, lower costs, and, pro and promote uh, disease prevention. And if I didn't exactly see a wellness utopia on the horizon, I was reasonably confident about the parallel forward impetus of healthcare and individual liberty. But as the writer Stefan Zweig would have put it, that was the world of yesterday. And like Zweig, who observed uh, the European golden age before the devastation of the First World War, quote, in our liberal idealism, we were honestly convinced 
that it was on the straight and unfailing path toward being the best of all worlds. And that all these miracles were accomplished by science, the archangel of progress, through sa change. But if Zweig went from optimism to despair on contemplation of the vicissitudes of the world and its wars, my shift in perspective isn't one of pessimism um, that was caused by the loss of faith in the nature of humanity. Instead, it was a realization that's been in the back of my mind uh, since I read a book uh, that was published in 2004 called The Great Influenza. Now, don't worry, we're not gonna dwell on the Spanish flu or even the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's about something that was hinted at in the book's foreword. And that is, quote, shortly before the great war began, the men who so wanted to transform American medicine succeeded. They created a system that could produce people capable of thinking in a new way, capable of challenging the natural order. So systems, that's the lens that shifted my focus. Um, when our own era faced its own great influenza, I didn't lose faith in the potential of cool gadgets and uh, personalized approaches. Instead, it was more like I'd been handed a pair of glasses that allowed me to see much more clearly all of the countless interactions and entanglements across the landscape of healthcare to form what is a complex and interconnected system and these events underscored the extent to which healthcare systems uh, interact across national borders and how they're influenced by decisions and actions that extend far beyond the immediate realm of healthcare. Things like supply chains, energy security, food security, migration pressures, and demographics. So that said, I won't be the umpteenth person to talk about lockdowns and masks and hand sanitizer production or vaccines, although obviously those topics do touch on regulatory challenges and unforeseen consequences of government policymaking, including matters not strictly tied to healthcare. But I do wanna start with some healthcare topography. And it's a terrain with a multitude of features and variations, including some components with which you're familiar. Of course, there's patients and caregivers and doctors and nursing homes, hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, rehabilitation centers, just in a few. And also things like imaging equipment, that is x-rays, MRIs, sonograms. And like it or not, there's also the government. And all of those various components interact in a number of different ways forming systems. And usually when we speak about healthcare systems, um, we're referring to national healthcare systems um, or networks of care within those systems. And those national systems have different forms too. You have single payer public systems like in the NHS in the UK or Canada. You have those that mandate universal coverage through private insurance, like in Switzerland, and systems that fall somewhere in between, like France, and even those without universal coverage altogether, the United States. And each of those systems is in turn influenced by factors such as cultural differences and national and local demographics. And in that landscape, there are areas that are relatively prosperous and others that are really woefully underdeveloped. And within it, a colossal river flows that affects all nations and all regions. And that river is data. And who collects it? Who assembles it? Who controls it? Who shares it? Who filters it? Who shapes it? And most importantly, who has the power to make decisions based on the answers to those questions? Well, we'll return to that in a minute. So much of the public debate about healthcare centers around those national systems. Which are the best? Which are the worst? What are best practices? So I want to stop for a moment to consider those questions. Um, 
Over the years, national healthcare systems have been studied and ranked. You may have even seen some of them. What are some of the models and how do we analyze them? There are a lot of rankings and they generally do not agree on who should occupy the top spots. Sort of like university rankings, the positioning is useful for political marketing, but it's essential to understand what metrics they are employing to underpin those rankings. Take, for example, many of them talk about access to care. And if a system provides widespread access to care, but the quality is not any good, is that really an indicator of excellence? And shouldn't healthcare outcomes matter, whether you're cured or whether they help you live a longer, happier life? And what about a system's ability to encourage innovation? And what about individual preferences? So back in 2000, um, the World Health Organization released a report with rankings focused on overall system performance. And somewhat surprisingly, it placed the United States system behind Morocco, Saudi Arabia, and Dominica. But that ranking makes sense if you know which metrics they used. According to their own website, they said, quote, it compares each country's system to what the experts estimate to be the upper limit of what can be done with the level of resources available in that country and measures what each country's system has accomplished in comparison with those of other countries. What kind of evaluation is that? The assessment system was based on five indicators, overall level of population, health inequalities or disparities, responsiveness, distribution of responsiveness, and the distribution of the healthcare system's financial burden within the system. But yet they didn't look about outcomes or the health of the population or innovation. Now, of course, that ranking was not universally appreciated. Some experts like the former head of the health division at the OECD uh, dismissed it as quote unquote notorious, adding that health analysts don't like to talk about it in private company. It's one of those things we wish would go away. Now, the OECD does its own rankings, but they leave out non-OECD countries, which mean that Singapore, which is a system that is almost universally lauded for excellent healthcare, is never taken into account. Well, then you have a group called uh, the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity, or FREOP, and they develop their own World Index of Healthcare Innovation to address that exclusion. And in their approach, they include the quality of the healthcare system, but also the ability of that system to improve over time through scientific and medical advances. And also the degree to which patients can drive quality improvements by encouraging insurers and healthcare providers to compete for patients' patronage. So concretely, that means evaluating countries through a different set of criteria, which are quality, choice, science and technology, and fiscal sustainability. And so, not surprisingly, they came up with a different list. And that means that Switzerland, the Netherlands, Germany, Ireland, and Israel, and the United States all earned excellent rankings in that order. Switzerland leading in quality, the Netherlands in choice, the US in science and technology, and the Czech Republic in fiscal sustainability. Of course, interestingly, the top five countries all offer universal private healthcare coverage as opposed to single payer, unlike the sixth place US, which received one of the lowest rankings for fiscal sustainability. And while national comparisons are helpful, Highlighting problems within systems, they don't address things like the impact of private alternatives in countries with public systems or the influence of patients seeking healthcare abroad. Consider Canada, for example, where 90% of the population lives within 100 miles of the US border. How does this interconnectedness and the availability of consumer choice affect healthcare systems? 
Okay, still with me? Good, we have a lot of ground to cover yet in our hour, so. Now in the middle of all of that analytical chaos, consider its interaction with food security, since lack of access to affordable and nutritious food increases the risk for chronic health uh, conditions like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, mental health disorders. And let's also take a look at how healthcare is interconnected across national borders, which leads us to think about things like trade and migration and disease transmission. What are some of those global health interdependencies? One of them, most obviously perhaps, is disease. Infectious diseases don't automatically stop at the border and hand over their visa. Outbreaks in one country can quickly spread to neighboring nations, as we became aware, obviously, with COVID. There's also the question of health workforce mobility. Doctors and nurses often migrate to other countries for better opportunities or to fill shortages. Um, that creates imbalances in uh, health uh, healthcare workforce availability and healthcare services in other regions. And that can even happen within countries. And you have what we call medical deserts or areas without access to healthcare. And then there are global supply chains. Okay. Obviously, pharmaceuticals and medical equipment are produced and distributed globally. Comparative advantage. And disruptions in supply chains anywhere from manufacturing to logistics and distribution can affect the availability of essential medications and medical devices. And so we saw how this played out in COVID with the difficulty that Western hospitals had in procuring uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, things like gloves and masks and gowns, right? Since China is a global producer of these items, and when the pandemic hit, its own demand for PPE led to export restrictions and disruptions in the supply chain. But COVID also highlighted additional vulnerabilities, such as with India, which is the world's largest producer of generic drugs. It's known as the pharmacy of the world. It produces, in fact, 40% of all the US generic drug imports. And the pandemic not only disrupted manufacturing because of lockdowns and illness preventing workers from showing up and being on the job, there were also problems in obtaining the raw materials and components used to make some of the drugs because a large number of those originated in China. And of course, that has downward effects like scarcity means prices rise. And I'll stop before I, before I start to embark on an hours long discussion on the unavailability of shipping containers and the backlogs that those cost due both to overregulation and the unavailability of workers. But, okay, finally, what about medical tourism? So people often travel across borders seeking medical treatments, including surgeries, organ transplants, specialized care, and cosmetic procedures. And that cross-border movement has economic implications as well. Not only affecting healthcare resources in sending and receiving countries, but does that have any benefit for the local healthcare system? So let's take a look. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I found myself passing through Schopron in Western Hungary, which is just next to the Austrian border. And it's a town that people my age would know as the site of something called the Pan-European Picnic back in 1989 that was one of the catalysts behind the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Well, it's become a worthy student of free markets, as I discovered, somewhat to my surprise, that Schopron is a bustling hub for European tooth-related tourism. It has over 300 dental and periodontal offices offering all kinds of uh, services. It's kind of medical tourism I know you're familiar here with uh, in Guatemala. And the influx of foreign tourists seeking treatment there also has a benefit for the local population. And I read an interview with a Chopron dentist who said he and other uh, of his colleagues could now afford to invest in sophisticated equipment they wouldn't otherwise uh, be able to afford and that this new fancy equipment consequently is also available for the locals. Now, of course, medical tourism takes forms beyond dentistry. 
and individual company or countries uh, develop reputations for their specializations. Turkey has become the global capital of hair transplants, in case anybody needs to know, uh, offering a luxurious experience at relatively low costs. South Korea is the capital of plastic surgery. India, on the other hand, has become a regional node and a very important one for certain types of outpatient surgery. And while it became that hub, it did it while developing successful and innovative processes and practices. Because it's interesting to note that medical tourism doesn't just make cheap healthcare available in exotic and interesting locations. The competition for customers and the adaptation of products and services within the particular constraints, especially of emerging markets, fosters something called reverse innovation. And what that is, is it's successful innovations in products or services developed in emerging markets that are then exported to established ones. And I'm particularly fascinated by an example uh, in India, that of Narayana Health, or NH as it's become known. So what's so unusual about this place? Well, imagine you need life-saving heart surgery but you're simply unaffordable. It's simply unaffordable to you, and you can't uh, you can't pay the cost. And this is something that touches me personally because when my daughter was a baby, she needed to have heart surgery. Now, fortunately, I was living in Texas at the time, and I had both good healthcare insurance and access to top-notch care. But a man named Devi Shetty, uh, Doctor Devi Shetty wanted to address that problem in India. And as he said in one interview, what's the use of brilliant surgeries when more than half of our patients can't afford it? In most countries, doctors just do what's best for the patient. But in India, we have a keen sense of how a treatment plan or surgery will impoverish the patient's family. And then he went on to say that real healthcare is not about heart surgeries, it's about heart never having to send a terminally ill child home because his mother can't afford it. But having a heart does not mean charity, which is not scalable. It means frugality, data management, and procedural innovation. And so with that approach in mind, he created Narayana Health uh, in 2001 in Bangalore, India. And by any standard, they're remarkably successful. They've treated over 2.5 million patients including 64,000 international ones from 78 countries, where it says international standards at Indian tariffs. Uh, and what are those tariffs? Just to provide an example, coronary by, uh, bypass surgery there costs approximately $5,500. Now compare that to the US, where it's over 106,000. Now, how does it cut spending and yet maintain high quality levels? So let's look at a, a little bit closer at some of the innovations that they put into place there. Um, surgeons at NH perform approximately 30 surgeries a week on average, which is double the rate at other hospitals. Now that sounds like it might be dangerous, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna tire them out. But they employ a production line approach where senior surgeons only come in for one of the six stages of heart surgery. And that allows them to, to do more procedures every day. It monitors and measures costs. It utilizes systems for financial information, centralized purchasing, and a number of other things. But finally, what's also really interesting, at least to me, is that their hybrid pricing model takes profits from people at the top of their pricing scale and uses them to subsidize surgeries for those who can't afford the full cost. And that dual approach allows them to scale the business while maintaining affordability. They do a number of other things, of course. They use digital x-rays, they do all kinds of process and, and procedure innovations, and they also came up with a different structure 
called the hub and spoke model with smaller clinics and little drive around buses that provide care in rural areas, but they send the specialized healthcare back to the main hub because that's where they keep the expensive equipment they can't afford to put in each of those places. Now, all of that and efficiency and volume needs to be accompanied, of course, by quality measurements. And that's like patient outcomes. Did the patient survive the surgery? Did they go on to be healthy? Well, at NH, um, the mortality rate 30 days after surgery, which is a good measure of whether it was a good surgery or not, um, the rate is only 1.3% die. And that's better than a rate sampled across a wide range of Texas hospitals, where you have some of the best healthcare in the United States. So you can understand with all of those uh, characteristics, why NH is a favorite uh, for consultant and academic case studies. You have a lot to learn from them. But medical tourism is only one aspect of transnational healthcare, and it mostly takes place on an individual patient basis. So how do systems act, or how are they impeded across borders? Well, one of them is regulatory hurdles. Um, of course, different countries have distinct regulatory procedures, processes, and criteria for evaluating and improving healthcare goods and services. And that means it's very difficult for smaller companies to introduce their products into multiple markets because of the complexities, the costs, and the paperwork involved with that. Um, for example, in the US and Canada, medical devices are regulated by the US Food and uh, Drug Administration, the FDA, and Health Canada, and they have separate approval processes and um, of course, South American countries each have their own regulatory bodies. And those companies have to navigate different registration processes and documentations and pay fees for each individual country. The EU does have a centralized regulatory system for medicines through the European Medicines Agency. However, medical devices still have to go through varied approval processes among EU member states. Now, there are some efforts made to harmonize regulation and facilitate mutual uh, recognition of approvals between countries to streamline that process and to reduce duplication for those comp uh, companies that want multi-market access, which of course affects economies of scale. Um, there is a thing called the Canada-US Regulatory Cooperation Council and the, U, uh, the EU's mutual recognition system, which says products approved in one state can be marketed in others without undergoing a full new approval process. But there has been recognition that sclerotic regulation means that the pace of invention and adoption is too slow. And that means there's some limited effort to offer expedited approval on certain healthcare products, especially those that meet what are called unmet medical needs and to accelerate patient access to innovative treatments. Um, the FDA has what's called breakthrough therapy designation and accelerated approval pathways um, for drugs that show substantial benefit for serious or life-threatening conditions. It's nice that the government decides that for us. Um, and elsewhere, countries have introduced fast-track approval for other essential medicines or treatments, uh, for things like communicable diseases. But that approach uh, involves collaboration between the various stakeholders. You need to have uh, health providers, industry stakeholders, and regulators actually talking to one another. So after we've looked at this map, Let's see how the topography was affected by the earthquake that was COVID. And we'll find that despite some obvious terrible consequences of the pandemic, there are some potential positive outcomes and opportunities as well. And after we've finished looking at a few of those effects, I think it's important to examine what those changes can teach us about how to approach healthcare going into the future. Now, 
A healthcare uh, Harvard Business School report argued that, quote, if we are able to transform our nation's care delivery and payment systems in ways that fundamentally improve healthcare for our patients, providers, and communities, we will have found the silver lining of COVID-19. And then in the New England Journal of Medicine, we saw COVID-19 disrupted the provision of routine care, forcing providers and patients to, to postpone many services and adopt virtual and non-contact strategies. And these changes present an, op an unprecedented opportunity to reevaluate the necessity of services that healthcare systems provide, embracing and enhancing the ones that provide most value and reducing or eliminating those that provide little or no benefit. In other words, there are some radical structural and organization changes that had to take place to adapt care to the crisis and others that were merely accelerated. There were also technological changes centered around digital health, and those can be loosely grouped into a few major disruptions, tracking epidemiology and artificial intelligence, telehealth, remote working, rapidity of research. And some of those transformative changes that healthcare systems made in response are likely to stay. One is an increase in cross-network uh, communication and coordination. And to help balance patient load, for example, during the crisis, countries in Europe and Asia set up rapid transfer services to move patients between hospitals when capacity limits hit. Uh, France, uh, I saw this you know, in front of me uh, at the hospital that I used to work at, they implemented tiers for COVID triage, designating which hospitals had the capacity to deliver acute care, which ones would provide non-COVID care, and which ones would receive overflow from others. And that included, for the first time, integrating private hospitals into the public uh, plans. Um, and of course, there were changes in other countries as well. And once such coordination and cooperation is in place, continuing that optimization becomes easier. So another structural element is a more urgent look at removing barriers to innovation that I mentioned previously. And it was particularly um, visible in the United States that there was a rather remarkable shift in healthcare regulations during the, panic, the pandemic. It was almost like a rule book got rewritten to adapt to the crisis. Significant change was the lifting of a really strange barrier that previously restricted the number of available intensive care hospital beds. They had to have only a certain percentage of the beds in any given hospital could be intensive care. So the government graciously allowed hospitals flexibility to expand their capacity and also swiftly implement local changes in response to surges in care. But it wasn't just about physical resources. There were regulatory hurdles preventing healthcare um, personnel who were licensed in one American state from providing services in another American state. And that meant that doctors and nurses from states that had lower infection rates couldn't go and help out in places where they were um, needed, like New York and California. And that's a classic case where bureaucracy ends up coming to a clash with urgency. And oftentimes, urgency will win out. So, and also telemedicine, so telehealth, which had sort of been on the horizon for a long time, but was not, um, was not adopted. There were other uh, barriers to sharing healthcare data. That received a real boost during the pandemic, and they changed regulations that limited its growth. Before, Medicare in the US and other insurance providers only reimbursed face-to-face -face visits. And privacy laws meant that you couldn't use Zoom, Skype, or FaceTime for medical consultations. Well, those outdated and unnecessarily restrictive rules became roadblocks when they were needed the most. But despite all those initial hurdles, the digital healthcare sector saw the availability of record-breaking funding. And that surge of investments primarily targeted COVID areas and uh, things like on-demand healthcare and disease monitoring. But what that also shows is resilience and adaptability in healthcare 
lead to innovation even in the face of unprecedented challenges. So another point to note is during that pandemic, there was a significant drop in non-urgent and non-essential medical care in many parts of the world, which led healthcare providers to take a little closer look and question the value of certain medical services. And that includes identifying and reevaluating what we call low value care. And those are medical treatments or services that either don't provide much clinical benefit or in some cases even harm them, uh, even harm patients. Think about things like prescribing antibiotics for a viral infection or ordering unnecessary imaging for lower back pain. And that's important because low value care is, is it takes up a, almost a fifth of healthcare expenses in the United States. And you can extrapolate that across the planet. Now, some people with serious conditions like strokes and heart attacks weren't getting the early treatment they needed because they were fearful of contracting the virus. So they didn't go. But that same backlog meant that there was a push for the adoption of virtual care and more home-based health care. And to take the UK as an example, telehealth and telemedicine as a share of total appointments increased from less than 1% to as much as 95% for some doctors. And that means that you can reduce costs and you can also uh, often boost patient engagement even beyond the pandemic. And then another little data point is that in the Veneto re uh, region of Italy, and we all know that Italy suffered greatly in the early stages of the pandemic, Veneto uh, suffered the, the lowest loss, one area suffered the lowest loss of life in Northern Italy and the best management of the crisis in Italy because general practitioners, so GPs, family doctors, were the point of contact between COVID symptomatic patients. Unlike another area of Italy, the Lombardy region, that centralized all patient triage in hospital emergency rooms with much higher de uh, death rates. Yeah, who knew that packing sick people together in one small place might cause disease to spread? Well, learning from the Italian experience, hospitals elsewhere put into place centralized digital triage and that reduced the need for scheduled appointments. Now, all of what I've shown you so far and talked about with you so far is sort of pedestrian compared to the potential future impact of generative AI, generative artificial intelligence, uh, which is, as IBM puts it, quote, deep learning models that can generate high quality text images and other content based on the data they were trained on. Okay, now I like that definition because it reminds us of some of the limitations of generative AI. So there are countless applications of AI that do not necessarily resemble Star Trek's emergency medical hologram, the doctor. Uh, it can be embedded in much more uh, smaller ways such as diagnostics, medical imaging, payments. And it can be also used in conjunction with accelerated drug discovery, devising precision medicine therapies and document processing. And on the horizon, you have preventative healthcare through predictive models and wellness behavior modification with nudges on wearables and mobile apps. And a company known as Absci is using it with synthetic biology to design new antibiotics, or antibodies rather, against cancers and immune diseases. And a tool by a company named Synthesize can help repurpose and expand the use of existing drugs beyond their initial use. There's a consortium forming for large language model research and the big, uh, and the big tech companies, and briefly, LLM or large language models is a deep learning algorithm that can recognize, summarize, translate, predict, and generate text and other content 
based on knowledge gained from massive data sets. What's important to understand is that data sets are not infinite. They are chosen, they are filtered, and they are gated. I saw, uh, I reached out to several friends in the generative AI space and they've shown me some of the things they're working on. There are little sliders for tolerance of things like hate or violence or nudity or whatever else in general data sets. Now, if you can imagine, that seems perhaps somewhat uh, innocuous, but imagine if you apply that to things like undesirable peoples, Uyghurs in China, or if you, uh, if you uh, filter out the elderly or the young or people with any particular genetic characteristic, that means that the AI outputs are shaped by the data sets and the LLMs that are employed. I hope that makes sense. So one of the heavyweights in that consortium is Google who has a variant of their LLM specifically designed to be optimal for medical applications called MedPalm2. And they're partnering with HCA Healthcare, which is a large American healthcare provider. Um, and my friends in the sector tell me that's the one to look at. So if you wanna look up what's happening, I suggest you look there. And then you have Microsoft and Epic with their own partnership and um, uh, they have their own potential use cases, such as filling gaps in clinical evidence using real-world data to study rare diseases. Um, but even as those developments cause great excitement, they raise questions. And how do these things touch on patient data privacy? Are there ethical boundaries? Do those boundaries transcend national borders? How do you avoid authoritarian surveillance states from poisoning data sets or using healthcare information pertaining to those groups or individuals in ways that intend to cause harm? Can we master what we unleash? So let's look at the crux of the issue, which is how do we design healthcare systems for the future? Uh, there are those who believe that we can design elegant and perfect systems for healthcare, especially in conjunction with the aforementioned generative artificial intelligence. At a bare minimum, it may solve some tricky problems in healthcare, but there are also those who propose that it will solve the Hayekian knowledge problem and usher in an age of fully automated luxury communism. Spoiler alert, it won't. Um, as it was pointed out in a recent paper by Asamoglu, uh, that sort of knowledge, um, as Hayek wrote, with which I've been concerned is knowledge of the kind by which its nature cannot enter into statistics. And that by implication is not, that not even an all powerful large language model uh, could deal with the true nature of dispersed information. And Hayekian knowledge is that of particular circumstances of time and place. In other words, it depends upon contexts, social and otherwise. Or again, to quote Douglas Adams, <laughs> a common mistake that people make when trying to design something completely foolproof is to underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools. Because as was noted in the book on the great influenza that I spoke about, it says, biology is chaos. Biological systems are the product not of logic, but of evolution, which is an inelegant process. Life does not logically choose the best design to meet a new system, a situation. It adapts what already exists. Much of the human genome includes genes that are, uh, that are conserved, evolutions built upon, again, what already exists. So perhaps we need a deeper level of analysis with new tools and frameworks that will allow us to form a different approach to the future of healthcare. One that will be robust and innovative and with a nod to Taleb, anti-fragile. So quickly, in order to do that, we have to move from examining healthcare as a mechanical system of levers and inputs with knowable results to considering it as a complex system. That is one that is nonlinear, dynamic, unpredictable, and not simply one that's complicated. Okay, so among the many things I'm not is I'm not a complexity scientist, but I'll give you a couple of brief uh, characteristics of a complex system. And that includes interconnected components 
Changes in one of those can trigger ripple effects across the entire system. Nonlinear relationships, that means small changes can have disproportionately large impacts. Like when one airplane being grounded means that they're not moving people and all of a sudden you have chaos in a country. Emergent behaviors. So complex systems exhibit emergent behaviors which are not directly predictable from the behavior of the individual components. And that can be things like unexpected patient outcomes, system bottlenecks, um, and it creates additional unanticipated consequences. You have adaptability and feedback loops. Their systems are adaptive. That means they're capable of responding to changes by adjusting behaviors and processes. And feedback loops, where outcomes influence subsequent decisions, amplify or dampen certain effects. Um, imagine you're dealing with a patient with a chronic condition such as high blood pressure. Patient is prescribed medication to bring that blood pressure down and everything seems fine. And so they start to feel better and think they're cured. So they stop taking their medication, which causes their blood pressure to shoot back up, which leads to additional problems. And that in turn prompts them to go back to their healthcare provider who then has to readdress the entire treatment plan. So this feeds back in. And that whole cycle of adherence and health monitoring and treatment adjustments is a classic feedback loop in healthcare. Now, we also have uncertainty and unintended consequences. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna uh, spend more time on that given our time constraints. So um, they're also, and the final characteristic is they're dynamic and evolving. That means there's continual changes in patient demographics, policy reforms, technological in innovations. So what does that mean? It means there are policy challenges. So complex systems exhibit unexpected behaviors in response to policy. Just like Bastia says in French, ce qu'on voit et ce qu'on voit pas, that which is seen and that which is unseen. We have to look what happens. There's optimization trade-offs, sort of like if you have one of those big long balloons and you press on one side and the other side goes up, if you attempt to optimize one area of the system, it can lead to negative impacts in the other. For example, reducing waiting times in one department causes problems in another. So you have to have resilience and redundancy to absorb shocks and disruptions. You should have data-driven decision-making and continuous learning. In other words, viewing healthcare as a complex system recognizes that numerous components and interactions create emergent behaviors and unpredictable outcomes, which make it particularly unsuited to rigid regulation. So viewed in the light of Clayton, of Clayton Christensen's work on innovation, lawmakers tend to approach policymaking as legacy approaches to established fields. They create rules for sustaining technology, for maintaining the status quo. Instead, we need a lighter regulatory approach that allows for the emergence of disruptive innovations and the right to fail. And one more minute, I'm almost done here. In order to create systems that won't collapse in the face of unexpected challenges, one that'll help us lead healthier, longer lives and extend lifespans and generally foster innovation, we need to adopt an anti-fragile approach of regulatory procrastination. That is, giving time and space for things to take their natural course without excessive intervention. To borrow a term from healthcare, we want to avoid iatrogenic harm. That means harm caused by intervention where the treatment is worse than the cure. We need to avoid the iatrogenic harm of overregulation that inadvertently causes more downstream harm than the regulatory crisis is trying to solve. Or as Henry Hazlitt put it, quote, when Alexander the Great visited the, the philosopher Diogenes and asked if he could do anything for him, Diogenes is said to have replied, yes, stand a little less between me and the sun. And it's what every citizen is entitled to ask of his government. And I think that's for the future of healthcare. Thank you.